Greetings again, my name is Jesse. These are my videos on Bible study and ministry. I have, well, I was going to say that for a very long time I've written articles, done YouTube videos. I did a lot of, I did a, what I call a mental health series on YouTube. Um, over 800 blog articles on many different subjects of religion, faith, politics, education, and particularly mental, mental health. Um, I came to the <coughs> understanding coming out of the presidential elections that just happened in America that there was there's a serious lack of sanity, reason, and personal peace. And I personally think that what we learned, uh, well, at least one of the messages, one of the lessons that I learned out of 2016 is that God is necessary. And that when God is not available, God's always available. When when people don't include him in his life, in their life, then some very bad things happen. They become into individuals, like individuals that go to baseball parks, and shoot at elected officials. We've seen a lot of vulgarity, uh, nasty attitude from the left after Trump has been elected. And I believe that, that what is more important than anything else is the Word of God. That's why I'm <coughs> that's why I'm explaining this. You'll hear the air conditioning in the background. I am what is known as West Texas, the city of El Paso, Texas. I just looked at the at the weather notice, and it claims that in El Paso, Texas, it is 103 uh, degrees. So, to me, the Word of God is a lot more important. And that's where I start. Therefore, that's where I'm going to um, go to right now. And there, there I am, and this is the e -sword um King James Bible program <clears throat> that you can find free on the internet or make a donation. I have gotten to Corinthians and I am in second Corinthians verse nine chapter nine verse one for as touching the ministry of the saints it is superfluous for me to write to you for I know that forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia that and I read this before Akia was ready a year ago and your seal has provoked very many yet have I sent the brethren lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf that <coughs> as I said you may be ready let's happily Less happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, as we say not, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, wherefore you have noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. Now, I want to highlight this right here. When you believe in God and you pray to accept <coughs> Him as your Lord and Savior, you are a saint. The Catholic Church doesn't make you a saint. It's not a title where you get to claim that you're better than everybody else. It is a title that says that you believe in God, you have accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, and because of that, you are included in the book of life. Your sins have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And now you are working for God in His ministry to reach as many of His sons and daughters that can be reached uh, because He wants everyone to have the benefit of life after death but he also wants you to have the benefit of his blessings while you're here on earth. 
I'm going to continue. But this I say, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God love is a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That ye also, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. And now he that ministers seed to the sower, both ministers bread for your food, and multiply your seed so, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgiving unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your profession, profess subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and of your liberal distribution unto them, and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be unto God for this unspeakable gift. Now what I would <coughs> highlight here is for God loves, well, this whole thing right here. This is what I would highlight. For a man according as he purposes his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves, loveth a cheerful giver. Um, I hear it commented that this church is so lavish, and that church is a little lavish, and so much money was spent on this, and so much money was spent on that, and they could have used that money to feed the poor. The church is necessary because it stands as a symbol of refuge. If you're lost, if you're confused, if you're hurting, if you're looking for answers, if you're searching, God is always speaking. God is always helping us. And every person is searching. Some people will go to the church in a way of trying to come close to something they believe will give them answers to their questions. The church needs to exist. And in order for the church to exist, <coughs> the members of the church, of that church family, need to, need to contribute to that church. And yes, that church needs to be a, a, an almost perfect example of God. You don't want to run into a broken down building and you can have ministry in a broken down building. But you want to have a sparkling shiny building. <clears throat> and you also want to have money for food to give to the poor. To feed children. Jackets. Um, some churches are, are um, do a lot of community service as far as employment. Helping people find employment. All of that stuff requires money and in the Old Testament in the Hebrew way it was 10% of your first fruits 10% of your best <coughs> and we are not held to that standard you could give 70% if all you have is 5% and you are happy to give it then 5% is good it, you put everything together and it amounts, and it's, it can be used to, to build a good church that will be there for those who are searching, and it will be there to help those in the community. But it's not a, you shouldn't give feeling that you're being ordered to give. But it's also a point of maturity. It, and it's, I would even say it's even a test 
of is God really in your life? One of the things that I, I came to recognize in this Christian experience is the understanding of how much need there is and that I needed to do something. I'm not bragging, I'm not saying I do great things, but I realize that I have an obligation and I also have a, um, I don't know what to call it, but a concern, a compassion, a sympathy, an empathy for other people, and I try to help them where I can. And if, if you really are of God, you understand that his children have needs and, and you want to help. You want to help the crying child who is hungry, who doesn't have a warm jacket for the winter. And that's part of being, of having God in our lives. And I don't believe in being long-winded because I know that it tends to bore the audience member. So let me move on to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am based among you, but being absent, and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with the confidence, with that confidence, wherewith I think to be the bold against the same which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty to God, to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought up to the obedience of God. I'm going to stop here because the human experience has many things that are subject to that experience. In the world there's a lot of pain. In the world, there's a lot of suffering. In the world, there's a lot of hurt. But there's also the experience of love. There's also the experience of peace. There's also the experience of joy. God has built us in a way where we can reason and where we can be rational and where we can see that this philosophy is in our best interest and this philosophy over here is not in our best interest. The philosophy of drug abuse is not in our best interest. The philosophy of being a gang member is not in our best interest. The philosophy of talking ourselves into depression with our negative thoughts is not in our best interest. So there's the experience of where we can be happy with God, not perfect, but trying to be innocent, trying to be pure, trying to be righteous, uh, try to be kind to our neighbors, try to be a pleasant person, a nice person, a good person, a decent person, a person who concentrates on his or her life and doesn't judge his or her neighbor. It, <clears throat> in other media, I have written that the only time I need to be concerned about my neighbor is when my neighbor is coming in my direction and it's obvious that he or she wants to harm me. Other than that, I should concentrate on my life and leave my neighbor's life alone. Now, if my neighbor asks a question or if my neighbor needs something, I shouldn't be opposed if I can help. But the point being is that we can have the experience of love and peace and joy, which is a better experience than the one of hurting, the one of being confused, the one of being lost, the one of being afraid of that our spouse is going to leave us or, or that we don't know how to be a good parent or we don't know how to manage this complicated industrial society. And it is a choice. And I can tell you that what I find in God is his innocence, his righteousness, his purity. He's not like me. He is clean. There is no blemish on him. That's why when I hear people saying, uh, Christ became sin for us. No, Christ couldn't be sin because Christ is God. Even when he, Christ was just like you and I, uh, flesh and blood, 
people wonder why you have God in heaven and Christ on earth, <coughs> being that they were both the same person, is because that is God's plan. That's how God organized it. And he organized it for a very specific point. And that point is that no matter what happens in life, because we saw Christ come back from the dead, and we saw him being resurrected, we can count on him. There shouldn't be anything that we say God cannot deal with. That's what God was showing us. He, he was telling us, Look at the worst thing that can pa pa happen in the human experience and look at the fact that I overcame it. You know, it's one of the Bible verses that's personal to me is, uh, the world will bring you tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have come and overcome the world. And that's what God is telling us. Ask Jesus Christ that whatever you're facing in your life, <clears throat> you can trust me to help you and you can trust me to help you because I went to the foot I went to the the, the the threshold of the door of death entered and came out back alive and if if, if if God can overcome death then we can trust him with anything and that's the that's the important message that with God the, the uh, we can be happy we can be free of pain we don't have to have nervous energy we don't have to have to have depression we can be happy with the life that we have we can be good we can be decent we can be kind we can be nice we can be a pleasant person and we can be a benefit to ourselves and our friends and our family members and enjoy their company in a healthy pure righteous innocent way trying to be pleasing to the Lord. Let me continue. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of authority, would the Lord have given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a one think this, that such as we are in the word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of number or compare ourselves with some that command themselves, commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measures, but according to the measures of the rule which God has distributed to us is a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorifies, let him glorify in the Lord. For not that he that commands himself is approved, but whom the Lord commanded. Now, to, to offer a, an opinion on what has just been said, um, there's always going to be tension in um, churches, always going to be tension in churches. And there's going to be things that um, we would wish were 
different, but humans being humans, you know, <clears throat> there's going to be disagreement. A lot of what, what people argue about uh, in the Bible has nothing to do with what's written in the Bible. It has to do with attitudes of individuals who want to presume to be superior in intellect and explain what that means. You know, the Bible justifies the Bible. And again, I only recommend the 1611 King James, um, authorized King James Bible, the original King James. Um, <clears throat> and again, somebody gave me a new King James and it's nothing like the original. Um, I would say don't read it. I would say don't read the NID, don't, don't Gideon Bible, don't, don't read those things. Get yourself a 1611 King James Bible, and that's the Bible you should read without the Apocrypha. Um, the reason being is, and, and I'm going to make this case again, a God strong enough and smart enough to create a universe is strong enough and smart enough to create the means by which he communicates with his creation. He wants us to know what he expects of us. And because he wants us to know what he expects of us, he has made the form to communicate with us. And I know he's not telling uh, different things to different people. I know he's only telling one thing to everybody. And that's important. And I know people have pride in their tribe or pride in their gang, but it has nothing to do with having pride in a tribe or in a gang. It has to do with accepting the only truth of God, the truth that He has revealed to us. And I and I believe this full heartedly, 100% confident. He has revealed it in the 1611 King James Bible. And there are discrepancies. People who are not born again, who have not received the Holy Spirit, who have not accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, uh, who don't believe in God, cannot give any credible opinion on the Bible. You must have the Holy Spirit in you. And the way the Holy Spirit works in you is, as Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you and my God and my Father's home, and somebody will come in my name as a helper. And that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has always been there. It's in the, it's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit, He is in the New Testament. As, as He was in the Old Testament because He is God. God will not manifest Himself in front of me and have a conversation. But through His Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, He will reveal things to me. And they will be consistent with the teachings in the 1611 King James Bible. Not because I say it, because God says so. And if you want to know what God says, read the 1611 authorized King James Bible. And in there you'll find that it is important to acknowledge God, it is important to understand that we are offending God with our sin, that we are disobedient, that we need to repent of our disobedience, and we need to believe in Him and we need to repent, and we need to bring and open our life to Him, to let Him into our hearts, let him into our minds, to accept him as our Lord and Savior. And it is a very simple prayer. God, I believe in you. I repent of my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. I need you and love you. Jesus Christ, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. He will do the rest. The rest is up to him. And it is a part of life. It's part of happiness, joy. It's part of wisdom, vision. God allows us to see things. God, God allows us to see how lost our neighbors are, how much need is in their life. And he teaches us so we can speak to them. 
if, if you are a person, if you are a person who has um, given your life to Christ, accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you have difficulty in talking to people about salvation, it may be because, well, no, it is because you're not focusing on the one true God. You're focusing on yourself. And if you listen to God, God will properly prepare you. But if all you're going to do is say, I am of this religion, or I am of no religion, you're going to suffer the consequences of it. It is reality that we are eternal. And that the only question is, is where are we going to spend eternity? I have told people before, listen, let's say I'm delusional and God isn't real. God is real and I'm not delusional, but let's just say that. Let's say there's no life after death. Let's say there's no heaven. I can tell you that even if there is no heaven, the way I am living, understanding what is right and what is healthy and what is good nutrition and where real love comes from and where real joy and peace and, and being able to deal with all challenges, we all have challenges, it's better in the Jesus Christ experience than in the secular world experience. There's a lot of psychologists, a lot of psychiatrists, I've written many articles on on mental health, on depression, on anxiety, positive psychology, uh, being being hopeful, be, having hope, changing our negative thoughts to positive thoughts, having fun, filling our day with fun, enjoying life, uh, uh, appreciating good things like friendships and family and good music. <coughs> and of course in that, it, it's God, sure. But there you are. Without God, you'll have some happiness. You won't have absolute happiness. You won't have real joy or real peace. The world needs God, God's kindness, pleasantness, His love, His concern, His care.